This is my first video update coming to you from Nicosia, Cyprus. Let's walk over to the city center and get a coffee and talk about some news. And um, this will be a quick video, I think. We had the UN vote, which I talked about yesterday in, uh, in a video. The UN vote was about condemning the Russian referenda and the annexation of the four regions. Russia actually wanted the, the votes in the United Nations to be a secret ballot so that countries could really express their, uh, their opinion without feeling pressure from the United States. But the, uh, your, the UN, they, they turned that request down and they had an open voting system. The final re results, it was uh, 143 countries voted to condemn Russia's annexation of the four regions and the referenda. 35 countries abstained and I believe five countries voted against the resolution. Now the combined population of the countries that abstained or voted against the resolution was over 4 billion people. Someone sent me an email as I was about to, uh, to record this video and they pointed out that 4 billion people population wise voted against this uh, Collective West US sponsored resolution. So that's significant. You had uh, five countries vote against against this resolution. And by the way, when I, when I say abstain, countries that vote to abstain is almost the same as a country voting against the resolution. So to me, I don't see much difference between a country abstaining and a country on the record voting against. So that's why I kind of lump the abstentions and the against as, as one in the same. But um, the five countries that uh, actually voted against, are on record to vote against, was, uh, I believe, Belarus and Syria and, uh, let me think, North Korea and um, some other countries, like another, I think Russia and another country, of course, Russia and another country. <laughs> that goes without saying. But the abstentions, the abstentions were, were very interesting. And um, it speaks to to the actual support that Russia does have because China abstained, India abstained. Boy, is that gonna really piss off the, uh, the White House, the fact that India abstained, especially after the, the uh, what was it, the Washington Post article the other day that said Biden is winning over India so the Washington Post runs an article which claims that Biden is winning India over and now you have India voting to abstain in this UN resolution. So that's huge news. You also had a lot of the uh, what is known as the global south abstaining. You had uh, a lot of countries in, um, in Africa voting to abstain. South Africa abstained. So you have India. China, South Africa, Russia. You almost have all the BRICS, but I believe Brazil actually voted uh, in favor of this resolution. So you almost have all the, uh, the BRICS united to, uh, to support Russia. I believe Armenia abstained as well. Many countries in the Middle East abstained. So um, a lot of the, the global South is on record, either by voting against or by abstaining on record to show that they don't agree with this Collective West sponsored resolution. Oh my God, oh boy, they really need to cut, to cut some of this stuff down. Makes it hard to walk. So, um, Let's see here. That was the latest with regards to this, uh, to this UN resolution. In the Washington Post article that I read yesterday, where I talked about how Biden is winning over 
uh, India and much of the world to align against Russia. They, uh, they made a, a point in that article to say that Africa, many of the countries in Africa, are still very much, uh, very much aligned with Russia and they look at Russia favorably. And the Biden White House said that they're going to be working on Africa to move them uh, away from Russia. And uh, when you look at the countries that abstained or voted against this UN resolution, many countries in Africa, many countries in the Middle East, um, they are firmly in support of, uh, of this fair world order. Russia, China, this whole new world order that is, uh, that is being shaped right now, this fair world order that is coming about. So, um, Macron, French President Macron, he once again issued calls to, uh, to Putin to get back to the negotiating table and to stop the, uh, the conflict, to search for some sort of uh, negotiated settlement. And um, the Kremlin actually came out with a statement the other day, and they said that at the G20, where Putin will attend in Indonesia, that's coming up in November, actually, Putin will attend, as will Elensky. It's going to be the first time that these two, media, that these two leaders are going to be in the, uh, in the same place. Um, the Kremlin said that uh, they would be open to, to a sit down with Biden. Biden's going to also be there, but they would be open to, to sitting down with, uh, with Biden in the U.S. To, uh, to talk about Ukraine, as well as other issues. So the Kremlin said that it never closes doors to diplomacy. But Macron, once again, is, uh, is being very two-faced because, as he said, that Russia should get back to the negotiating table and uh, stop the, the conflict with Ukraine. He throws it all on Russia's side, even though in the article from, uh, once again, from the Washington Post that I read you yesterday, the Biden White House made it very clear that uh, they don't want Ukraine to negotiate and they feel that Ukraine is actually winning and has no reason to negotiate. That was what the Washington Post said, citing, citing anonymous U.S. sources. Uh, very, very loud this morning here. No people around, but it's loud. It's very bizarre. Uh, so, so Macron is throwing it all on Russia. Russia has said that they've always been open to negotiations. The United States and the collective West the Biden White House, the UK, they've said that uh, they don't want Ukraine to negotiate. They actually advise Ukraine not to negotiate. Ukraine says that they're not going to negotiate because they feel like they're winning. Okay. Macron then comes out and says, by the way, we're going to continue to supply weapons and arms to Ukraine. And as a matter of fact, we're going to send them air defense systems right away. I'm like, oh boy, the, the latest trend now for the collective West with regards to Ukraine, the latest way to show your, uh, your support for this, uh, for this cause is to now send air defense systems. So the Netherlands said that they're, that they're fast tracking air defense systems. The United States said that they're going to be sending air defense systems. Germany so that they're going to be sending the Iris T air defense systems before their own military gets their hands on it. They're going to actually send it to Ukraine. And now you have France saying they're going to send air defense systems. I believe the UK, of course, the UK, Liz Trust, they said they're going to send air defense systems. So, I mean, Ukraine has gone from a non-existent or a failed air defense system, which Russia has exposed and even to this day continues to expose as they're probing the electric grid, which is what I think they're doing. Uh, Alexander has done many videos on, uh, on what Russia may actually be up to with their everyday missile strikes in uh, various cities and locations in, uh, in Ukraine. They may be probing the electric grid, looking for weaknesses, looking for vulnerabilities, seeing how Ukraine reacts. 
uh, the uh, the Collective West is now sending all their air defense systems that they have. So Ukraine went from having nothing or something that wasn't working and non-existent and vulnerable to Russian attacks to now having an, an overdose of just every different air defense system under the sun. Right? We're going to get the U.S. air defense system. We'll get the U.K. We'll get the Iris T. We'll get to the Netherlands. We'll get the French. I mean, it's... It, it's hot, it's hot and cold, you know? It's one extreme to the other. And uh, Brian at the New Outlist, he's done multiple videos discussing air defense. And uh, it, it's, he makes the point, and it's common sense as well. These aren't simple systems. It's just not some sort of plug and play. You know, bring them in, bring in the air defense system, we'll set it up and it's ready to go. The people that are gonna be operating these air defense systems they uh they they have to be experienced soldiers these are these are uh complicated systems multifaceted multi-layered and uh, now you're going to get a whole bunch of different systems from different countries for which uh the ukraine military is uh is not trained to operate it at least from what i understand no one has operated the Ukraine military to, uh, to operate all of these different systems. Five, they're getting now five or six different air defense systems. So who's gonna be operating these systems? How are they gonna run this stuff? Well, there's one answer, NATO, NATO. And uh, this is gonna be another sign, another clear indication that NATO is actively involved in Ukraine. And this is going to be another type of mission creep situation because as they bring in all of these systems now, as they flood Ukraine with all of these systems from different countries, different technologies, you're going to have to bring NATO soldiers who understand how to operate these systems and NATO trainers as well, who are now going to embark on a long and extensive training uh, regimen for the Ukraine military. They're going to have to be present in Ukraine. And what that means is that NATO's going to be, be fighting Russia again. You're bringing NATO one step closer to fighting Russia. Again, you're bringing them closer to fighting Russia because they're already in Ukraine as well. You already have NATO people in Ukraine, but you're bringing in more and more now. Mission creep. That's what's happening. Mission creep. And NATO came out with, uh, with a statement, with a document, a plan for Ukraine, and they're calling it the 10-year the plan. And basically what NATO is saying is that, uh, that they see Ukraine as a 10-year project. What they're going to do now in Ukraine is they're going to, to make the entire Ukraine military a NATO military. So NATO is, is signaling that uh, well, two things, they believe that this war is going to last a long, long time and they're going to make it last a long, long time because their goal is to extend this war for as long as possible. But, um, and this is an article according to Politico, by the way, but uh, this is a de facto NATO accession for Ukraine. Maybe it's not a formal accession. Maybe the, the NATO members aren't all voting to let Ukraine in. But when you come out with a statement saying that uh, the NATO alliance will launch a scheme to rebuild Ukraine's defense industry over the next decade, hoping to phase out Soviet-era weapons in favor of Western gear as Washington and its allies pledge new rounds of military aid to Ukraine, it means that you're making the, uh, the Ukraine army into a 100% NATO army. We will be looking at defense planning requirements to get Ukraine fully interoperable with NATO, an unnamed official said it's about shifting away from Soviet equipment to NATO compatible Western equipment. And of course, the money for the MIC, they're going to make a whole bunch of money from this. So NATO sees this as a long conflict. They've got a 10 year plan for Ukraine. They're going to integrate Ukraine's military into, uh, into NATO, fully integrated it. 
fully integrate it. They're going to phase out Soviet weapons, whatever they have. They're going to bring in NATO weapons. They're going to enter into all kinds of big, huge military uh, contracts funded and supported by the collective West, our tax dollars. And uh, they're going to extend this war out over 10 years. That's their hope. And of course, you have mission creep. With each passing week, each passing month, NATO is getting more and more involved in, uh, in Ukraine. So um, that is the latest with regards to, uh, to NATO. We'll do one more story and then we'll wrap it up. We'll go to a clown world after, after I talk about aluminum because we are getting a Bloomberg report which is saying that, uh, that the U.S. is looking to now sanction Russian aluminum. The Biden administration is considering a complete ban on Russian aluminum in response to Russia's missile attacks on Wednesday, Bloomberg is reporting, citing its sources. According to the report, the White House is eyeing three options that could include an outright ban, increasing tariffs to levels so punitive they would impose an effective ban or sanctioning Russian company Russo, which produces the metal. This is not a good idea. <laughs> this is a very, very bad idea being floated by the Biden White House. Now, listen to what uh, Bloomberg says. Initially, where is it here? Sources familiar, sources familiar with the decision making told the media outlet Bloomberg that the U.S. administration had initially held off sanctioning Russian aluminum, fearing it could disrupt global suppliers. However, there are fewer products left for the U.S. and allies to ban in response to war escalations. The discussion by the White House has been ongoing for weeks, the sources note. Industry experts have been warning such a move could destabilize metal markets around the globe. The embargo on the aluminum which is crucial to most heavy industries, could potentially force consumers in the U.S. and other countries into a rush to find replacement metals. Russia is the world's second largest producer of aluminum after China. Data cited by Bloomberg shows that, the US, that in the U.S. alone, Russian supplies traditionally account for some 10% of total aluminum imports. The country was the third largest aluminum exporter to the U.S. in August statistics reportedly show. So basically, this is a bad idea. This is not going to help the economic uh, situation in the U.S. or the world. Very, very bad idea. But the logic of the Biden White House is such that they have no other products and sanctions to dish out to Russia because they've sanctioned everything. And now they're getting into into really dangerous territory by proposing to sanction products that experts are telling them don't do it. Didn't the experts tell the Biden White House, don't go after SWIFT? But the Biden White House went after SWIFT. Don't go after Russia's foreign currency reserves. But they went after Russia's foreign currency reserves. Don't mess around with gas. Don't mess around with oil. Don't talk about price caps. But they continue to mess around with it. And they continue to talk about it. And now, aluminum, metals, bad, bad idea. But no reverse gear. And I fully expect the Biden White House to push forward with some sort of sanctioning of, uh, of Russian aluminum. Bad, bad, bad idea. They, they're they're sanctioned crazy. They're sanctioned crazy. They're addicted to sanctions, plain and simple. And they have no other answers for Russia. The only answer they have to fight Russia, to combat Russia, is, uh, is more weapons, more money, and sanctions. That's it. That's their plan. More weapons, more money, sanctions, regime change. And hopefully we'll get regime change out of all of this. Hopefully all of this stuff that we're doing is going to lead to some miraculous regime change at the Kremlin. I don't know why or how, but, you know, Let's just hope, let's just hope and pray that this time an aluminum sanction is going to piss off uh, some oligarch. I believe that we may be talking about Deripaska. Now, I could be completely wrong, but 
I do believe that Deripaska, you remember him. He's the, uh, he's the oligarch with the whole pen, pen incident, that, that video that went, well, that went viral many, many years ago where Putin asked for the pen and Deripaska gives him the pen. And he was also the oligarch involved in Russiagate and all that stuff. I could be wrong. So it may not be Deripaska because I'm just kind of, just kind of trying to think here. Rusal, Rusal, who's the oligarch that has Rusal? Anyway, uh, they're hoping that maybe they, they put sanctions on the right oligarch who can somehow cause the, uh, the right chaos or friction to, uh, to lead to some sort of regime change in Russia. I guess that's, that's their kind of, that's their line of thinking. Let's do a clown world. And since we're talking about oligarchs, let's talk about the king of oligarchs. The richest man in the world. He still is the richest man in the world, isn't he? Elon Musk. Elon Musk is canceled. He is about to be canceled. Not by social media, not by Russia. Even though his Starlink system is being used to uh, is being used by the collective West and NATO and the Ukraine military to, to fight the war against Russia. Russia is not canceling Elon Musk. It's Ukraine that is canceling Elon Musk. Specifically, the Ukrainian port city of Odessa has apparently decided that Elon Musk's face no longer has a place on billboards, picturing international celebrities who have supported Kiev amid its conflict with Moscow, the move comes after the Tesla CEO tweeted a Russia-Ukraine peace plan. The advertising department is removing the photo of Elon Musk from billboards with which we expressed our gratitude to those who backed Ukraine, Odessa's administration wrote on Telegram. I'm going to have to cross here because my coffee shop is right across the street. Even though you have Costa coffee, which is good as well but i'm gonna go to coffee house right across the way here so i'm gonna make the illegal crossing once the cars stop let's see odessa also published a video showing a worker gluing a larger piece of blue paper over the billionaire's face <laughs> that's funny <laughs> elon musk you've been canceled You've had a blue paper glued over your face. That's hilarious. <laughs> Starlink is still being used, even though it's uh, not as effective as it used to be. Because the Russian military, they're, uh, they're jamming it. No doubt about that. The collective West mainstream media will never admit that the Russian military, they figured out ways to, uh, to mess up Starlink because well, there would be some, uh, some national security implications there, but um, no doubt the Russian military has figured out ways to, to mess up Starlink. And that's not good for business. That's not good for Elon Musk's business. That's not good for the US uh, defense business, the Pentagon business either, because Starlink is, or was going to be, and is a nice uh, tool for them to, to use. So that is the video, everybody. Elon Musk canceled in Odessa. TheDuran.Locals.com. Go to the Duran shop. 10% off. Use the code good day. Look for the Duran on Rockfin. Look for us on Locals, Telegram, Odyssey, Rumble. And, uh, and yeah, that's it. Look for Alexander's channel. Look for the Duran's channel on all those platforms. I am here at Coffee House. Definitely come here if you're in Nicosia. Coffee house, downtown, uh, downtown Nicosia. They have good Costa Rican coffee. Take care. <laughs>